everyone, and welcome to this week's College Vine Q&A. If you haven't tuned in with us before, my name is Katie, and every week I spend time answering four pressing college admissions questions from our YouTube commenters. This Q&A video series is designed to help you get a better understanding of a wide variety of admissions topics. And toward that end, if you'd like to submit a question for us to answer on an upcoming video, you can leave that question in the comments below. Also remember, as always, to subscribe to the College Vine YouTube channel so you're the first to see when we post our latest video. Let's go ahead and get started with today's four questions. So our first question for today comes from Lisa, who asked us, for schools that accept either the ACT or the SAT, if I submit both to the school, how do they consider them if they're not that comparable? For example, if I have a 35 on my ACT and only a 1400 on my SAT, will they just toss out that lower SAT score? Well, at College Vine, we recommend only submitting both scores if both of them are exceptionally impressive and place you higher among other admitted students. As a general rule of thumb, use the information available from a simple web search to see how last year's admitted students fared according to their test scores. Then select the scores that place you closer to the top of that display. So for example, if your SAT scores put you in the 75th percentile of admitted students from last year, but your ACT scores are only in the 50th percentile, you'll want to submit the SAT scores. Even though your ACT scores are still comfortably within the range, they're not quite as impressive as those SAT scores, and so submitting them could take away from the good impression that was left by your SATs. Another important thing to note is that the testing policy at each school you're applying to may differ slightly. So the admissions page for each college generally lists out its testing policy in an obvious place, and you need to go find that. If you can't find it, you can check out the FAQ page or as a last resort, contact the admissions office directly. The bottom line is that you need to understand the testing policy at each school you apply to to make an informed decision on which score to submit. Before you send any score reports, research the testing policy at each school and come up with a score report plan for each school individually to maximize your chances. For question number two today, Varsha asked us, are college visits mandatory? This is a great question and it's one that we actually get all the time because a lot of students and parents are wondering if they need to hit the road and visit every school on their list. The answer is that college visits and tours are not mandatory. They're not mandatory. However, there are some pros to visiting, but there are some cons to visiting too. Let's go over those pros and cons so you can make an informed decision about whether or not you want to visit the schools that you're interested in. So let's start off with the pros of visiting colleges. Pro number one is that visiting demonstrates interest. So by visiting schools, you do show that you're interested in the school and admissions officers do enjoy seeing that. You can further your demonstrated interest on the visit by actually talking to admissions representatives and taking a big walking tour of the campus. Pro number two is that visiting gives you a feel for the school. So when you visit a school, you'll get a sense of the campus, its surroundings, and you might even get to speak with current students or professors. Those conversations and the tour can help you gauge the fit of the school and see if you can actually envision yourself being a student there next year. Pro number three is that visiting helps to narrow your school list. So if you're visiting schools before submitting applications, it'll help you actually narrow down that list and decide which to apply to. You'll get a feel for each school and then you'll be able to remove the schools that you just don't see yourself at. So those are the pros, but here's the one main con of visiting schools. It's pretty obvious. It's just that it costs a lot of money. Visiting schools can be really expensive, particularly if your list is long and contains a lot of schools that are far away from where you live. If you do want to visit schools, but you don't want to spend a lot of money, one option is to wait until after you've already been admitted so that you're only visiting the schools that you're actually deciding between for matriculation. But if you'd rather not spend money visiting schools at all, there are plenty of other options. One option is online virtual tours, which many schools now offer. And another option is fly-in and diversity programs. Those programs actually allow a small number of diverse and high achieving students to visit campuses for free. The colleges will pay for your expenses, including airfare, room, and board. So that can be a great option if you're looking to save some money. So to sum it up, college visits are not mandatory. However, they can definitely help you make a more informed decision about which schools you should apply to and which schools you might ultimately want to matriculate at for next year. For our third question today, Matt asks, how widely used is the academic index? Do colleges actually assign one third weight to each of the GPA, SAT and ACT scores and SAT twos? Well, for those of you that don't know what the academic index is, it's a calculation that combines a student's overall academic performance into a single numerical score. Admissions officers can then use that numerical score to make a quick assessment as to whether a student has enough academic qualifications to be considered as a top candidate for that school. Most schools don't publicize how they specifically calculate their academic index, but in general, the index takes into account three main factors. The first is your GPA and or your class rank. 
second is SAT or ACT scores, and the third is SAT subject test scores, or SAT2 scores also, if the school requires them. The school then converts this information to a score on a 20 through 80 scale, with 80 being the best. That 80 is roughly equivalent to a 4.0 on weighted GPA or a perfect 1600 on the SAT. Those three areas are then added together to get a total index score of 240. The schools that use the academic index tend to be Ivy Leagues and other highly selective colleges. Because the AI is often used as a screening tool, the index helps admissions officers make decisions on tens of thousands of applications in a few short months, which they probably wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Because a high academic index is directly related to grades and standardized tests, it's actually a metric that you do have control over. So if you're looking to improve your grades and test scores, visit the College Vine blog, which is linked below, or browse some of our other YouTube videos. Overall, we have a lot of resources to help you boost that academic index heading into application season. For our last question of today, Allison asks us, how important is getting an internship in junior or senior year in the career that you're interested in? Well, Allison, internships are a great option for your extracurricular profile because they show that you have real-world job experience in the major or career that you're interested in. However, if you don't have an internship in your activity profile, that's okay. There are plenty of other quality extracurriculars that you can participate in throughout high school, particularly if you're able to take leadership positions, start new projects, or even start a whole new club to really demonstrate your skills. But if you are interested specifically in getting a high school internship, here are a few tips to help you kick off your search. Tip number one is to consider your interests and aspirations. So look at your academic and the activities that you've done before and use those as a starting point. Think about how all of those interests might fit together into a career, into what you want to be when you grow up. Get creative and match your soft skills with concrete and desirable workplace skills to help you come up with an idea of which fields you're interested in. Tip two is to leverage your connections. So because it's not always easy to get internships as a high schooler, you should use any personal and professional connections you have. You should network and you should be sure to discuss your internship search with anyone who will listen because that'll probably help you get to a yes. Tip number three is to take advantage of online tools. So the internet can be a great place to search for internships. Many websites such as LinkedIn or Indeed have dedicated searches for high school internships and allow you to filter certain opportunities by geographical area, by field, and by time commitment, among many other filters that are built into the platform. As mentioned, you do not need to get a high school internship to get into your dream school. Admissions officers simply want to see dedicated leadership in really any activity, and so that can happen in a lot of forms of extracurriculars. But if you do want to get an internship, you can follow the tips we discussed and also visit the blog at College Vine for more internship advice. Thank you to the four of you who submitted our questions for this week, and hopefully those answers were helpful not only to the four of you, but also to everyone who was listening. Remember that if you have a question you want us to answer in another video, drop that question into the comments below and we'll feature some of you in upcoming weeks. And don't forget that if you're looking for free guidance on your essays, your applications, and more, you can visit us online at app.collegevine.com and sign up for a free account. See you next week for our latest Q&A.